Well, good morning. It's my delight to uh, welcome everyone as we assemble on this beautiful first day of the week, winter morning, to come together to worship our great God, Lord, and Creator. Grateful for the presence of everyone here at the building and even some visitors that we have with us. We're so glad that you've chosen to be with us on this special occasion when we do assemble as God's people to worship Him, we pray, in spirit and in truth. I'm grateful to have everybody that's joined us via the internet, face, Facebook and Zoom. I'd like to use uh, some verses from 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verses 8 through 11, to help us set our minds on what we're about to do. So important that we just focus on Almighty God, His Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and lifting their name up in praise and worship and adoration. In 1 Chronicles 16, we're told, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon His name. Make known His deeds among the peoples. Sing to Him. Sing praises to Him. Speak of all of His wonders. Glory in his holy name. Let the heart of those who seek the Lord be glad. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. I think those are some wonderful words for us to ponder and to meditate on for just a few moments as we ensure that our hearts and minds are ready to engage in worship. Brother Kurt Williamson is gonna lead us uh, in our singing today, in singing praises to God. He's gonna have a song, and then I'll have the uh, scripture reading from the Gospel of John chapter one. And then we'll have two more songs. Brother Matthew will lead us in our opening prayer to the Father this morning, and at the appropriate time, James Powell will lead us as we partake of the emblems, remembering our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Let us worship, Brother Kurt. Number 47, number 47, God is good, he is so good. So very good. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. Jesus is real, Jesus is real, Jesus is real, he's so real to me, he saved my soul, he saved my soul he saved my soul and he made me whole I praise his name I praise his name I praise his name name he's so good to me scripture reading this morning from God's holy word is going to come from the gospel of John chapter 1 beginning in verse 1 if you'd like to follow along John chapter 1, and I'm going to be reading from the New American Standard Version. 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Number 375, <clears throat> 375, the Lord's my shepherd. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want he
Next song will be number 618. 618. Let me live close to thee. In thy field I would wield sickles brave and true. In the fight for the right I would dare and do. Spend my days in thy praise all the journey through. Let me live close to thee each day. Let me live close to thee. Guide me all along the way. Let me live close to Thee. Let me walk close to Thee each day. Not the crown nor renown that the world might see. I would work, never shirk, blessed Lord, for Thee. But to know when I go that my soul is free. Let me live close to Thee each day. Let me live close to Thee. Guide me all along the way. Let me live close to Thee. Let me walk close to Thee each day. Help me bear and to share some poor pilgrim's load. Be my friend to the end of the toilsome road. I would sing to my king in the soul's abode. Let me live close to thee each day. Let me live close to thee. Guide me all along the way. Let me live close to thee. Let me walk close to thee each day. bow with me as we approach the Lord's throne. Oh, graceful, holy, loving, and merciful Heavenly Father, we are grateful that you allow us to approach your magnificent throne and name through prayer. For we realize and understand we are frail and weak creatures before your omniscience as well as your omnipotence. We bless your holy name, Father, for you have been truly grateful, gracious towards us during this whole year of 2020. We bless your name. We understand we are undergoing this season of a pandemic, but yet those of us who are still here are able to offer praise, glory, and honor to your holy name. Thank you, Master, that you have preserved our lives, that we can yet work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We are grateful that we have this opportunity this morning to come before your holy throne and participate in a memorial worship through means of a feast to your son, Jesus. May, may we remember who he is, what he has suffered for us, and see it in the body of your church today. And understand as we deal with each other, what he suffered that we might be able to be loving towards one and another. We bless your holy name this morning, Father. As the psalmist so often tells us that you are magnificent and glorious forever and ever, meaning that your glory 
and your rulership of this entire universe never ends. May we always keep that in mind as we go about our daily activities, knowing that without regard for how bad things seem to be going, you are yet in control of this universe. May we keep our hope, our trust, and our faith ever anchored in the promises that your holy word renders forward for us to see. May we do that through daily study of your word and daily paying of homage to your holy name. We pray this morning that you would bless those among our lot who are struggling with illnesses, especially those who are struggling with this COVID. We pray that they might be healed if it be your holy will. We thank you for those you've already healed at our request, Father. We pray for those who are traveling during this holiday season that they might be kept safe. And as we go about the remainder of this service, we are praying for Brother Bill as he breaks the word of life to us, that he has a great recollection of the things he's prepared to share with us. May we take it on, Father, and apply it to ourselves and live that life daily that you would have us as your children to live. We seek all of these blessings through the name of your Holy Son, Jesus. Amen. For the Lord's Supper, we'll sing number 161, 161, Hallelujah, what a Savior. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior, bearing shame and scoffing rude in my place condemned he stood sealed my pardon with his blood hallelujah what a savior guilty vile and helpless we spotless lamb of god was he Full atonement, can it be? Hallelujah, what a Savior. Lifted up was he to die. It is finished, was his cry. Now in heaven exalted high. Hallelujah. What a Savior, when he comes, our glorious King, all his ransom home to bring. Then anew this song will sing, Alleluia, what a Savior. As we gather around this table this morning, we should have our minds fixed on that great sacrifice as we just sang a few moments ago. With, Hallelujah, what a Savior for what he has done for us. The Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 9 and beginning in verse 11 says, but Christ be, being come and high priest of good things to come, my greater and more perfect tabernacle, 
not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of, of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in, once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and go uh, goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve a living God. And as we look at that, the, that great sacrifice that, that, that was offered, we also, dear Father, to, to read what the Apostle Peter mentions here concerning that great sacrifice. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1, beginning in verse 21, we have written, and he, even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we, ye should follow in his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye are healed. As we assemble around this table to partake of the Lord's Supper, let us keep in mind those things which the, the most horrible death that Christ died upon the cross for us. Let us give thanks for the bread. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful for that great sacrifice that your son made upon the cross, that he gave his life and shed his blood. And we pray, Father, that as we partake of this bread in remembrance of that sacrifice, that we will examine our hearts and our minds, that we may partake of it in a manner that is worthy unto thee. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Our God and our Father in heaven, once again we come before thy throne to give thee praise and honor, to remember the sacrifice that Christ made for us on the cross. And as we partake of this fruit of the vine, dear Heavenly Father, we pray that we will remember that great sacrifice and that blood that was shed, and that we will partake of it in a manner that is well-pleasing in thy sight. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
If you want to mark the song that will be sung after the lesson, it will be number 278, 278, God is Calling the Prodigal. And before the lesson, we'll sing number 479, I Know That My Redeemer Lives, 479. If it's convenient, I ask that you stand. 479. I know that my Redeemer lives and never prays for me. I know eternal life He gives from sin and sorrow free. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life He gives. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. He wills that I should wholly be in word and thought. Then I his holy face may see when from this earth life freed. I know, I know, Redeemer lives. I know, I know, eternal life he gives. I know. Stands a place prepared for me. A home, a house not made with hands, most wonderful to see. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life He gives. I know. Well, good morning. Here, uh, our crowd's thinned out a little bit, but we're always thankful for the ones that are here. As a brother Ron noted, we have some visitors. We're glad that you're here. Glad to be a part of our worship here in the assembly. And those of you that are looking in by way of the internet, we're glad that you have joined us as well. Uh, just a comment or two uh, before I enter into my lesson. Uh, next Sunday, we begin our new quarter, new year, new quarter. So we're going to do things a little bit different. I'm going to let Ron explain all that part of it. That's not my, and I, I have no clue how it's all going to be done, but we're doing two classes. My class is going to be on... Uh, Evidences of the Bible, why I believe the Bible, really, I think is what it's called. And so we'll have some good lessons on that. Matthew and I will be teaching that. I guess Matthew knows that, uh, but we'll work on that together some. I have some material, and uh, we'll be looking at that, and I'll get that handed out to you sometime midweek this week, so you can be ready for next Sunday. Also, next Sunday, I might just add, uh, I won't be preaching, but we're looking forward to a great guest speaker, as we've already announced, uh, uh, Pam and uh, your Doug. No, you're Kirk. <laughs> Grandson, and we're looking forward to him speaking to us as well. Uh, so anyway, those are what's on the horizon, so uh, that's what's on schedule. Well, I want to talk with you a little bit this morning about being tested by the world. 
tested by the world. I mean, we are in every way, even as we go through this pandemic, being tested. But I'm talking about here where we're talking about Israel being tested, which is a type or a symbol in a sense. Uh, it's not the best word, symbol, but more type. But so that you understand what a type is, Israel is a type of the church. And so the church is tested by the world, even today. And so I want to think about that. And as I began this lesson, I'm thinking about a story that I read uh, by Rick Byers, who has done a number of his uh, things for the History Channel, a great researcher, a great producer of short stories. He wrote a book called uh, The Greatest Stories Never Told. And there's a hundred stories in there about different things. And one of the ones he tells is that the Hessians, who were the German troops that the revolution, that the British used, there are some 30,000 of them that they used uh, to come and help them fight the colonists. And when Washington was making that famous trip across the Delaware on Christmas Eve and so forth, uh, or Christmas Day, his troops were ill-fed, just worn out, just a ragged bunch. They had been fighting, but they, and they were, they, they were just sleepless. And uh, the Colonel Rawl, I think is his name, was the Hessian Colonel, was invited to a Christmas party. And he had, in fact, earlier had said in that day that, that those clodhoppers will not invade us because they knew Washington had been through a great war and so forth, and they weren't coming to get him. Well, during the period of that time of the party that night, a British sympathizer, a farmer, came bearing a note to the Hessian colonel. And uh, he did not want to be disturbed. He was playing cards, and so he just folded up, never read it, and put it in his pocket. The next day, Washington's men fought them at Trenton, New Jersey, and won. They, but they were so surprised, weren't expecting it. In fact, uh, Washington's men's powder and their muskets were so wet it couldn't, wouldn't even fire. So they used them as clubs, and they used, them as, they used the bayonets on them, and so forth, and still defeated this. Colonel Rawl lay mortally wounded. As the doctors cut open his uniform, out fell the note. And he read the note, Colonel Rawl read the note, and was so shocked, he said, had I read this note when I should have, I would not be laying here now. And that's probably true, because the note warned them that Washington's army was coming. My point is that we get so distracted by the things that we want to do that we fail to deal with what is important. We confuse the urgent. What we're doing right here, right now, as if this is the most important thing there is. And we confuse that with what is important. And so I think that's one of the big ways in which the world really tests us. Satan is using the world in a lot of different ways to distract us and throw things at us that get us uh, unfocused, uh, disoriented to our spiritual being. In Deuteronomy, the 12th chapter, and the reason I use do this, this text is such a, a wonderful text uh, is because, you know, this is God, Moses, preparing the people to cross over into the promised land. This is that generation whose parents have died and failed to, miserably in, their, in, in, in having the kind of faith and trust in God they should have had, and so they perished in the wilderness. Now Moses is pray, preparing them to cross over into the, into the promised land. And one of the things that he reminds them of in chapter 12, and at verse 5, is that when you go into the land, you shall seek the place that the Lord your God will choose out of all your tribes to put his name and make his habitation there. There you shall go, and there you shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes, and the contribution that you present, your vow offerings, your free will offerings, and the firstborn of your herd and of your flock. 
He said, it's there. God will tell you where that place is. And of course, it's not until the time of Solomon that Solomon said, Jerusalem is this place where he had built the temple, and this is where God causes his name to dwell, and this is where they were to come to worship. In the interim, then, he gives them these instructions as well, preparing them. Beginning in Deuteronomy, the 12th chapter, he said, verse 29, When the Lord your God cuts off before you the nations whom you go in to dispossess, and you dispossess them and dwell in their land, take care that you be not ensnared to follow them after they have been destroyed before you, and that you do not inquire about their God, saying, How did these nations serve their God? That I also may do the same. That I also may do the same. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way, for every abominable thing that the Lord hates they have done for their gods. For they even burn their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods. Everything that I command you, you shall be careful to do, You shall not add to it or take from it. And then in chapter 13, which we should just, if you're reading this, I would encourage you just to read right on through the end of the chapter 13. But in chapter 13, the warning continues about uh, being turned aside from God, about being distracted by idolatry and, and people that would do that sort of thing. For Israel, as I said, being a type of the church uh, in the Old Testament, God was trying to get them to understand that that the uh, mixing of pagan elements with the worship of Jehovah would never lead to a richer faith. The same is true for us today, though we don't have to worry about idolatry in the sense that they would have. I would say this, of denominational practices. They we want to borrow and, and, uh, from them and practice some of the things that they do, and yet it, it, it's the same as them borrowing from the countries around them. It never made them richer. It never developed their relationship with God. It was in, meant to ensnare them and to lead them away. And so in our speech and our thoughts and our actions, what he's pointing out in verses 29 and 30 is You are not to do this after the way that these nations have done them. God has given us the means, the instructions, the way in which he wants to be worshipped. And it is just as important how we worship God as it is to who we worship. And that's a point that he's making in this very text that we just read. That you cannot worship in this way, he said. So detestable when somebody begins to go in the wrong direction. And listen, once you you pass through a stop sign, once you you just ignore a stop sign, there's no stopping place. He said every abominable thing that they practiced, God hated. And he said even to the point that they burned their sons and daughters in the fire. They didn't start out that way. But that's what they became. So I think it's important that we understand that, that, not your, uh, that, that our worship must be free from all influences of the world, religious world. I mean, if we're reading anything in the book of Revelation about the false land beast, the, the, the false prophets and so forth, we're seeing what they did and how they tried to destroy the people of God. And then he reminds us of the grievousness of violating worship with false practices. And and we need to understand that against the background of what God is demanding of an utter loyalty to him. To him and to no one else. To nothing else. And violating the worship of God is to make our worship a form of idolatry. When we want to substitute practices for what God has told us not to do or what God has told us to do, it's an act of rebellion. It's regardless of of what the good intentions may be involved. God is warning us that these things ought not to be. In the New Testament, Jesus would have said, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Hebrews 12 verse 28 
reminds us that our God, or 29 reminds us that our God is consuming fire. Verse 28 tells us that he has given us the means by which we can come and worship him with reverence and godly fear. That's how we worship him. But there needs to be that sense of loyalty, that sense of respect, that sense of truly wanting to please him and no one else and nothing else. So that when we come then into the, the, the 13th chapter, notice if you will verse 1, if a prophet or a dreamer of dream arises among you and gives you a sign or wonder. Then three, he said, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dream. This, the, the, in the next, th- there's three classes of, uh, of things here that Jesus talk, or that Moses talks to them about. And it's always put in the if-then mode. If you have them doing this, then this is what you need to be aware of. And what he's talking about here in the first one is that to follow a false prophet into idolatry, we're tested by the world. Now, we may not, somebody may not bring in a, a, a golden calf of some sort to worship. But when we start devising things after our own personal desires, instead of what God has said, then that's a form of idolatry. And what he reminds us is that the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass. And if he says, let us go after other gods which you have not known them, not known, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice, and you shall serve him and hold fast to him. Listen, the whole, the whole structure of this chapter really is probably the, the warning. Each one of them has a warning. But they all three apply to each one equally. The first is don't follow false prophets who want to lead us into idolatry. Idolatry is not necessarily for our day and age. As I said, some statue, some relic, or something along that line. But listen, anything that takes a place of what God has instructed us becomes an idol. Then our worship becomes the very idol, idol that we're worshiping. We're not worshiping God. And we need to understand that. It, worshiping God is about being utterly loyal to God and seeking his ways and holding fast and walking as he talks about in this text. That's what it's all about. It's not compromising. It's not trying to give in to the lowest common denominator of people and their thinking to try to appease them. We're not here to appease you. You're not here to appease me. We are here to serve and honor God and God alone. How you feel about it and how I think about it matters very little, if anything at all. And we must get that through if we're going to make an impression upon the community around us. You want to know what's going to convert people are people who are living and walking what they're preaching, and what they're teaching. God knew that, and that's what God is wanting out of his people here, and by extension, he's wanting that out of the church today. So don't follow false prophets, he said, so that you can purge the evil. Notice, if that prophet, verse 5, or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has taught rebellion against the Lord your God. You know, His point is not that they can do miraculous gifts, not that they can do special fascinating things or be uh, charismatic or whatever. He said that's not the issue. The issue is that whatever it is that they're teaching you, is it leading you away from God? As I said to you before, it is not that we have to know everything that the Bible teaches or that we have to have an answer to every false doctrine that is there. You know, the question we just need to ask ourselves when somebody brings something in that we're not used to hearing, is this going to lead me closer to God according to the Scriptures? Is this going to lead me closer to God? I grant you that there are things out there on the periphery that sometimes are hard to answer, and the only question we can ask ourselves is, Is this leading me to God? 
There's a lot of social issues that we deal with if we would just stop and ask ourselves that question. Whether we're talking about social drinking, whether we're talking about gambling, whatever it is we're talking about, those lines, somebody will automatically say, well, the Bible doesn't say not to do that. My question is, does any of it lead you closer to God? I mean, if you feel that it does, and you can, and, uh, you know, maybe that's a matter of personal judgment or liberty, but I fail to see how it does or can. So those are the kinds of things that we have to deal with when we come up to those questions that we face from time to time when the world is testing us. Uh, the second thing is he, he talks about family. You know, we're tested by the world to follow family and friends into idolatry. Verses 6 through 11, if your brother, the son of your mother, your son or your daughter or your wife, you embrace or your friend who is as your own soul entices you secretly saying, let us go and serve other gods. So without regard to persons, God said anybody that would lead you into that direction. Somebody can't not say, please don't say. Oh, this is Old Testament. We're living under New Testament. Jesus makes the same point, friend, in Luke 14. If we love father, father, mother more than we love him, then we're guilty of this right here. He said, I think, as I said to you a moment ago, uh, that, that all of these warnings at the end that he gives are in the middle of them. You know, like he's taught rebellion in verse 5. This, this is what they're guilty of. Or this other one says, let us go and serve other gods. Uh, He said, you will not, verse 8, you shall not yield to him or listen to him, nor shall I pity him, nor shall you spare him, nor shall you conceal him. But you shall kill him. your, Your hand shall be first against him to put him to death. Afterward, the hand of all the people, you shall stone him to death with stones because he sought to draw you away. Here's the point. He sought to draw you away from God. Now, I realize we don't practice a corporal punishment as a church today as they did in the theocratic kingdom of of Israel. But nonetheless, we are, as he says in verse 5, so you shall purge the evil from your midst. And so here he's saying anything that would draw us away from God, we need to separate ourselves from it. We're to be a distinct people, a holy people. A people devoted to God. Hold fast, he says. Loving God. Jesus warns us of false prophets. The New Testament writers warn us. Even Jesus reminds us in his relationship with Peter, his good friend and one of his main disciples. In chapter 16 of Matthew and verse 23. He said to him, get behind me, Satan, for thou art a rock of offense. Paul rebuked Peter without fear or circumstances of men. In other words, we have a responsibility to the truth, to God, and to upholding that above everything else and living that. And then he reminds us as well in this Same text of verses 12 through 18. We're tested by the world to follow politics in idolatry if we're not careful. Even though I know what he's saying here, if if you hear in one of your cities, which the Lord your God has given you to dwell there, that certain worthless fellows have gone out among you and drawn away the inhabitants of the city, saying, let us go and serve other gods, which you have not known. You know, our obligation, our allegiance is not to the city, or to the politics, our allegiance is to God. That's who we, we're, we're, we're to, to pledge our life to. Not to that party, this party, any other party, but to God and God alone. And what he reminds us of in this same text is, uh, in verses, look at verse 12. Uh, he said, if you hear, there's the if there. And then if you go down to verse 14, notice what he said, then. You shall inquire and make search and ask diligently. And behold, if it be true and certain uh, that such an abomination has been done among you, then you shall surely put the inhabitants of that city to the sword, devouring it to destruction, all who are in it, and its cattle with the edge of the sword. You know, I thought about this 
text right here and what he's telling them and how to deal with it. And I thought, you know, really, when, when the kingdom divided between Rehoboam and Jeroboam, and Re- uh, Jeroboam took the ten tribes to the north and then established his own religion, as it were, I mean, really, Judah's obligation then would have been to go destroy them, according to this text. Uh, had they done that, then what he says, and notice what he says. Uh, if you'll do that, uh, in verse 17, uh, you know, just burn it, destroy it. None of the devoted things shall stick to your hand that the Lord may turn from the fierceness of his anger and show you mercy and have compassion on you and multiply you as he swore to your fathers. So, you know, the point of it is, is that it would cause Israel, all of Israel, to fear God, to respect him, because they're taking a stand for the truth. Even when it came to cities, even when it came to families, even when it came to our favorite teacher. Our obligation and, and responsibility is to the Lord. 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, and verse 12, when talking about this point here, to follow politics into idolatry. Now, even Paul understood that when he wrote in 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, and verse 12. He said, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Now, that same statement is made in chapter 10, but with a little different outcome that he's seeking to point out. Verse 23, 1 Corinthians 10. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. And again, to build up would be what? To lead us toward God. Uh, And and what he's saying here, we're not going to be mastered by anything other than God. Yeah, it, it may be okay. We may think this is permissible. We may think that within the realm of Christian liberty or something along that line, this is permissible. But Paul said, look, unless it builds up, Or if it dominates me, I'm not going to have anything to do with it. And so here again, the politics of it all and how we try to rationalize things in in order to practice things and to do things and look around taking a consensus of things. It happens in the church, and that's who he's talking to. In 1 Corinthians, that's who he's talking to in Deuteronomy. If we look at, again, Referencing 1 Kings 12, where the kingdom had divided and Jeroboam had gone to the north and Rehoboam to the south. You know, one of the things Jeroboam did is he appealed to the convenience of the people. He put a, he put a, a golden calf at Dan and one at Bethel and said, you know, you don't need to go to Jerusalem. Here, stay right up here. You don't have to, you don't have to go that far. And, it, and he knew what it says in that text is, He didn't want them to go to Jerusalem lest their heart be turned back to the Lord. Why? Because if they went down to worship in Jerusalem, that's where God had said, that's where the truth was being taught at that time, for the most part. And he didn't want their heart turned back to the Lord. He was leading them astray, just what Deuteronomy talks about here. We cannot compromise with the truth, making excuses on the basis of our favorite preacher or on the basis of our family or on the basis of our friends. We may lose friends. Listen, James 4 reminds us rather poignantly that to be friends of this world is to be an enemy with God. So it seems as we look at this text in Deuteronomy 13, there are three objectives that he wants accomplished. Uh, In verse 5, he says to purge out. He wants his people to be undefiled. And then in verse 11, it says he wants to cause all Israel to fear, to never again. Look, Look what he says in Deuteronomy 13 and verse 11. Deuteronomy 13 and verse 11. He said that he wanted this done to deal with these people. No eye pity him, no spare him. Don't any, he said, and all Israel shall hear and fear and never again do such wickedness as this among you. If Israel had only followed that practice, 
And then also uh, not only to purge out, not only to keep uh, or to cause Israel to fear and, and respect, but he said in verse 17 and 18, that the Lord may show us mercy and compassion. Those are the three objectives when it comes to disciplining, when it comes to dealing with false teachers, family, uh, politics. The objective ought to be in my walk with God that I'm determined to walk closer to him than anything else in this world. These things are a distraction. At last, some... Seven, eight hundred years after Deuteronomy, you have the prophet, God through the prophet calling Judah back to him. He says, Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God, who teaches you to profit, who leads you in the way that you should go. Oh, that you had paid attention to my commandments then your peace would have been like a river and your righteousness like waves of the sea. God instructs us for our good always that we may enjoy the best of life in a way that is going to be profitable, in a way that's going to draw us nearer to him. We never know the minds and the hearts of those that are present, but as we're going to sing this song, God is calling the prodigal to come without delay. There may be one here that needs to respond. If you're watching by means of the internet, we invite you to text us, call us, get a hold of us, let us help you. Brother Kurt's going to lead us in this song. Won't you come while together we stand while we sing? God is calling the prodigal, come without delay. Hear, O oh, hear him calling, calling now for thee. Though you've wandered so far from his presence, come today. Hear his loving voice calling still, calling now for thee. Spread and the feast is waiting there. Hear his loving voice calling still, calling now for thee. O weary prodigal, come, calling now for thee. thank Bill for that powerful lesson from from God's Word. Thank Kurt for those wonderful songs we've been able to lift up in praise to the Lord. Thank you for your presence this morning, whether you're here at the building or you're assembling with us this morning via the internet. If you're visiting with us, and we do have a number of visitors with us this morning, thank you for assembling with us this morning and blending your voice with ours as we praise our great God, Lord, and King. We will assemble via the internet on Zoom this afternoon at 5 o'clock. We'll have another opportunity to come together and study 
God's holy word, and Bill's going to be wrapping up uh, this week, uh, tonight and Wednesday, our overview of the wonderful, amazing book of Revelation. So I encourage everyone to join us this afternoon, 5 o'clock on Zoom. The kids, all of our children, will have a Zoom class this afternoon beginning at 4 o'clock. And uh, they're having some great classes together, all of the kids coming together to, to look at God's Word and encourage each other. As Bill mentioned uh, before he got started with his sermon, we will, we're wrapping up the year. We're quickly coming to the end of the year, as everybody's aware, so we're going to start the new quarter next Sunday. And if you remember, we went out and surveyed the whole congregation as to what you would like to study from God's holy word in uh, the new year. And there were four topics. They were one on apologetics that Bill will be starting us off with, why I believe, why we can know that God's word is not a man-made book, the importance of having great confidence that the Bible is the inspired word of God from God to us that we might know him, love him, and one day enjoy him forever in heaven with the saved of all ages. So that's one study. I will be doing the same time on a separate Zoom. We're going to do this. Unfortunately, um, the virus is still rampant and uh, hasn't slowed down much. So we believe it's safest and best to continue with Zoom for our Bible studies in January with the vaccine going out. Pray that things will go much better during the first quarter of the new year and we can come back to the building uh, for the second quarter starting in April. But we're going to have two adult classes. Bill's Why I Believe. I will be doing a study from the, the Gospel of John. Uh, if you'd like to join me for that. We're going to be taking a deep dive into that wonderful gospel from the eyes of the apostle whom the Lord loved with our intention that we would come to a deeper love for our Savior, Jesus Christ. Come not just to know about him, but to know him and have that intimate relationship with him as the apostle John had. So both those, so we'll start off. Here's how it'll go. Like Bill says, it's going to be a little, maybe a little bit tricky. We're going to start off with the normal Zoom, come together, welcome, have uh, a song, a prayer, and then if you want to join me for the Gospel of John, you'll disconnect from that Zoom. You'll come over to a new, new Zoom that will be sent out to you, a link, separate ID, passcode, separate link. Hopefully just click on the link and you'll come right in to my Zoom Bible study. We'll go through my study and then we can connect up again with the, uh, the original one, have our announcements, closing, in prayer, close, uh, closing prayer, and then as we typically do on Sundays and Wednesdays, have a kind of a care group meeting to check up on everybody as to how everyone is doing. Put that out as an email this week. Uh, if you think you're going to get confused or you are confused, please reach out to one of us. Um, we want you to feel confident to either, again, engage in Bill's study, why I believe, or my study. And by the way, uh, those four, there are going to be four topics. I think everybody's seen the email. It'll be why I believe, Gospel of John, Hebrews, study of the book of Hebrews, and the Sermon on the Mount. Those four topics will be done twice throughout the year. Each topic will be done twice throughout the year. So let's just say you want to do Bill's study. Well, that study will be done a second time. My Gospel of John study will be done a second time. Hebrews will be done twice, and also Sermon on the Mount will be done twice. Hopefully that's clear. Any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us, and we'll get that. The kids, the children will continue in Zoom. I know they love to get together, but again, we believe it's best right now after much prayer and consideration and looking that we, we continue with Zoom for the children. They'll have the children's class Sunday afternoon at 4 and Wednesday evenings at 6 
at least through the first quarter. And again, hopefully things will start looking much better as we go on into the new year and maybe get back to the building in April. We have been having some good song classes on Sunday afternoons. We're going to uh, stop those through the rest of the year um, with the holidays, and we will re resume in January, um, probably the 10th and the 24th. Instead of every Sunday, we're looking at two times per month, second and fourth Sunday afternoons, and again, with the intent of working on improving our singing, that we can offer our very best sacrifice of our lips, our praise, our singing to God Almighty uh, with the songs we already know, working on harmony, the mechanics of singing, um, and also working on some new songs as we have been doing. So I want to encourage you. Uh, we typically start at, if you know, on Sunday evening, Bible study at uh, 5. We'll start the song class at 4.15, just 30 minutes, 35 minutes. Believe that it will be beneficial and helpful to all of us as we try to do the very best in our worship and praising God. Hope you've been um, listening to Bill's two-minute messages. I believe he does a great job in, in sending out messages. We're going to be doing a new effort with trying to better use social media, specifically Facebook, to get out to a demographic around the building here. Um, going out perhaps five to ten miles, trying to what we call Facebook boost um, Bill's messages, information on who we are as the Perry Hill Road Church of Christ here in Montgomery, trying to engage people that are looking for God, looking for truth, looking for help in these troubling times. So I want to encourage you to listen to Bill's messages and then like them. Go up there and like them. That helps. I don't know. I'm not a technical guy, but somehow that helps, quote, the algorithms to kind of push it out there harder and, and get the message of God's word out to our community, out around the building here, to seek out people that want to come to know God, know the truth, and have the hope of everlasting life. So listen to the messages. They're only two minutes. They're good. They're encouraging. And hopefully they're going to be helpful in taking Christ to Montgomery, to the world. So like them, forward them on, um, be praying. Please pray. Pray that, that we can take Christ to the world. There's no more important thing we can do than to help people come to be saved and to have eternal life when this very short life on earth is over. Also, um, Will King, who's going to be helping us relook at our website to, so that when people like something about Bill's messages or something they see on, on our Facebook page, they can easily come back in, ask questions, uh, get involved with the Bible Correspondence course, um, maybe join us, find out ooh, what is Perry Hill Road really all about. Come and join us and be a part of our uh, family here and worshiping God and encouraging each other as we pass through these, these difficult times here in our country. If you would bow with me, I'm going to lead us in closing prayer this morning and then afterwards uh, try to give you all an update on a few of our family members. Please bow with me. Dear Father in heaven, what a privilege it is to bow before you, the great I am, the great creator, the one who holds the universe, the world together by the power of your word. We praise you, Father, and we're so grateful for this time we've been able to assemble as your children to worship you, the living God. And we pray that we have done so in a way that has pleased you and brought honor and glory to your name. Thank you, Father, for this beautiful day. Thank you for your word that has been proclaimed through your servant, Bill. 
Thank you for the love we have for each other as we have come together to encourage each other to walk in your ways, to overcome the testings of this world and the challenges and all the distractions that can pull us away from the kind of people that you would have us be as we journey through this life and we pray on to heaven. Please watch over us, continue to guide us and lead us through this world with all of its pitfalls and challenges as we keep our eyes on Christ, on heaven as our goal, as you as our Father in heaven. All this we ask in the name of Jesus, your Holy Son, our Savior, amen. Please take a seat if you're still standing.